Uh, my interview there with Tony Blair. Now, right now, it's getting late on a Sunday night on the other side of the world in New Zealand, where today the Business and Trade Secretary has signed the most significant trade deal since Brexit. Now, that is the UK joining the 11-country Pacific trade bloc, which is known as the CPTP. Peak, get that right. Uh, the thing is, the government itself says it's only going to add an 1.8 billion a year to the economy in 10 years' time. Well, I'm glad to say that Kami Badenoch, who is fresh from signing the deal, has stayed up to talk to us at live from Auckland. Thanks very much for being on the programme uh, today. So, what benefits are you hoping this trade deal is going to bring? Uh, thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, it's fantastic to be in New Zealand. I'm here severely jet lagged, but uh, we've had a wonderful event signing uh, this trade deal. And one of the uh, really exciting things is just how much all the other 11 countries have been looking forward to joining. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is where most of the world's uh, global growth is going to be coming from. In about 2035, we estimate about 50% of global growth is going to be coming from that region. Uh, it's the fastest growing one. Half the middle class will be from there by 2050. And we've got a seat at the table. There are other countries who are queuing up to, to join. We've got there first. We will have an influence on new countries that are exceeding. So there's everything, to, there's everything to play for. This is great news for the UK. You say it's great news for the UK. Um, there are 11 members of the CPTPP. How many do we already have free trade deals with? 12 now. We're 12, because we're in. 12 now. How many of those 12 or the other 11 do we currently have free trade deals with? The content of the free trade deals that we have with those uh, countries is different from what we're getting with CPTPP. That's why it's called the comprehensive uh, as well as progressive agreements for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And there is uh, one additional country, which is Malaysia, that we have no agreements whatsoever with. But it isn't just about whether or not we have uh, an agreement. We've got agreements with many different countries. It is about the size, shape and scale and the cumulative impact of things like rules of origin, which are pooled between um, this uh, trading bloc. I guess... What people will say is, look, I'm, I'm not sort of denigrating that this is a you know, good thing to be doing or whatever, but if there's only one country in this block that we don't already have a free trade deal with, how much impact is it really going to have? You're saying that it's going to bring in £1.8 billion pounds in 10 years' time. I mean, the Man City squad value of the, is about £5 billion, pounds, just to put that in context. Is it really going to make that much difference? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, it is. It's going to make a significant amount of difference. And I think one of the things that uh, I have tried to do is make sure that people understand that that was a potential forecast based on what would happen if we did not join. The static modelling, that's not what we should be focusing on right now. Even within our department, we're doing lots of different uh, new modelling. What we should be doing is praising uh, the effort that it's taken to get us into this regional block. I remember uh, a few years ago, people in the UK were laughing and saying that this would never happen. This is showing that we are not isolated. The UK is looking outwards. We are not an insular country. I heard your interview with Tony Blair uh, just a moment ago about us not being insular. We're looking outwards towards the world. We have a seat at the table in the fastest growing region. Countries are queuing up. And quite frankly, what's going to make a difference is how much we use this free trade agreement. And that's what um, I think I really want to impress upon you. If we keep telling everybody that this is not something that's worthwhile, it'll become a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have to stop doing this, uh, talking down our country. No other country does this. This is a fantastic deal. Uh, this is a great uh, regional trading bloc that we're joining. It has countries like Japan, Canada, Mexico in it, as well as uh, New Zealand and Australia, which I'll be going to tomorrow. So this is something that we really need to celebrate. Talking about looking outwards, um, how would you rate our chances of a trade deal with the US? Uh, the US is not uh, carrying out any free trade agreements with any country, so I would say very low. It all depends on the administration that's there. Different presidents have different priorities. Lots of countries have been looking to have a free trade agreement with the US, including us. But for now, they said that that's not something that they want to do. And we need to respect that. And instead, we're having other types of trading interactions and trading uh, deals with them. You can look at what's happened with the Atlantic Declaration from the visit that the PM made uh, 
to the US recently. You look at the trade dialogues we're having, a lot of the cooperation that we're doing on security, for example, looking at uh, economic coercion, the work that we do with Five Eyes, the work that we do uh, together uh, uh, with the G7 and G20 and other multilateral fora. So free trade agreements are great, but they're not the only tool uh, in the trade toolbox. There's a lot more that we can do, and we have to work with our partners uh, by consensus. We can't force them into things. It's what the two countries uh, or the two sides of the deal agree to. OK. Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the Conservative Party, if I may. Um, ben Wallace has announced that he's had enough. He's standing down as Defence Secretary at the next I'm reshuffle. Sorry, I didn't hear you, Sophie. Apologies. I just wanted to talk about Ben Wallace, about uh, who has said that he is going to uh, stand Wallace. down as Defence Secretary at the next reshuffle and also uh, stand down as an MP at the next election. He was once talked up mm. as a future leader. Are things that bad for Conservative MPs? Well, I think uh, the fact that Ben has been uh, in politics for about 25 years means that we should be celebrating his career and not uh, worrying about it. The fact is that there have been many leadership contests and he's never thrown his hat into the ring. He has never expressed any leadership ambitions. What he has been is an amazing defence secretary, uh, incredibly capable, uh, one of the few people who had the foresight to predict what was going to be happening in Russia and Ukraine and making sure that we did our part to ensure that Ukraine was ready for it. Um, he's been a fantastic colleague to work with. I've really enjoyed working with him. Um, I'm sad that uh, he's stepping down, but I understand that public service is something that is very grueling and draining, and I think that we should be uh, celebrating Ben's public service rather than trying to link it to unrelated issues. At the same time, though, it's not hard to see a bit of a pattern. I mean, you'll, you'll I guess, forgive us for trying to link it to some of the other issues in the Conservative Party. If you look at the polling, if you look at uh, some of the recent uh, by-elections, and of course a trio of by-elections coming up next week, if voters in three very different seats send a message that they want the Conservatives out, what, how do you think your party should react to that? Do you think you should just keep going with the plan or is it time to change tack? So uh, I'm not going to speculate on what the results of the by-elections next week are going to be. Obviously, we are not being complacent, but different, uh, different things happen uh, during by-elections than uh, during general elections. The fact is this government has a, a large majority, and what we need to do is, focusing on, is focus on delivering for the people of the UK. It is very hard for governments to win by-elections uh, when we've been uh, in power. This is more than midterms now. We've been uh, in office one way or another, whether in a minority government, in coalition, for about 13 years. So it's understandable if we're not necessarily winning by-elections. Obviously, there's everything to play for. I've been out campaigning uh, in seats like Selby. And what we're doing is reminding people about what our uh, objectives are. There's the Prime Minister's five priorities. We've got a plan. We've got something to deliver. And that's what we hope people will be focusing on. Some people are change, calling for a change of direction, though, uh, in your party. Backbench is getting a bit restless, in particular on taxes. There are reports that the Conservatives are considering scrapping inheritance tax. Would that be something that you would support? Uh, we keep all taxes uh, under review. In an ideal world, we wouldn't have to tax anything. I'm afraid that that's not the way that we can uh, fund public services. But it's uh, the Chancellor's job to actually look at everything in the round. And right now, what we're trying to do is uh, focus on inflation. One of our five priorities is halving inflation uh, and making sure that inflation gets lower, stays low, is going to have a far bigger impact on most people's uh, discretionary income than uh, inheritance tax policy. Um, and uh, remember, one of the other agreements, what, pardon me, one of the other priorities is improving and increasing economic growth. That's to, partly um, my job. That's why I'm here in New Zealand, focusing on bringing in that money, that business, that trade into the UK to, by signing these, uh, these good trade deals. Sorry, just to jump in, if I may, um, it's always hard, I know, when we're not in the same room. Um, you just said there that in an ideal world, we wouldn't tax anything and that wouldn't be how we would fund public services. Is that what you actually mean? No, that's not what I said. That's, that's, that's not what I said. In an ideal world, uh, there wouldn't be any taxes, but you need taxes to fund public services. Right, I see. Taxes yeah. uh, are something that we need, the taxes are something that we need to fund public services. But you're asking me about a specific tax policy, uh, taxes the Chancellor's area. 
my point is that inflation is the thing that's really going to make a difference right now rather than speculating on taxes. People will always have a particular tax that they want to see raised or lowered or whatever. But right now, the reality is making sure that we help with the cost of living. And that's so do you think some of your colleagues perhaps need to get real on taxes then? Everybody has a right to an opinion. People are constituency MPs. They have lots of constituents making requests. I have lots of constituents asking me about various tax policies. We look at these decisions in the round. What is not right is to uh, speculate, uh, for me, uh, a Sunday evening about any particular tax policy that is for the Chancellor, and that's something which he makes decisions on and announces at a fiscal statement. You're being um, admirably uh, well behaved. I'm sure at number 10 we'd be very happy with the answers uh, that you've been given so far. I'm just interested because you obviously ran well, for the it's leadership. It's my job to be professional, Sophie. Sure. <laughs> you obviously ran for the leadership, and many people saw you as having, I guess, the standout campaign. Um, but in the end, you withdrew, you backed Rishi Sunak. You can be loyal to him, as you have been in the interview, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is this isn't necessarily your vision of conservatism is it that you are implementing it's somebody else's and i just wondered if there's anything that you would do differently or prioritize in a certainly slightly different way i'm not sure what you mean by uh this isn't my vision for conservatism the fact is we have a prime minister who is competent who is very serious who is dealing with the issues of the moment. People are always asking me about leadership. They've been doing so since the first day I became an MP. And the fact is that I have more influence now being business and trade secretary than I've ever had. And what I'm interested in doing is delivering for the people of this country and in supporting Rishi, making sure that we win uh, the next election. Yeah, people do ask you a lot about the leadership. Um, you're often sort of seen as one of two potential future candidates of the right of the party against Suella Braverman. Is it a bit um, frustrating or secretly do you quite like it? People are always speculating. It's a weird thing about politics. It's the only industry where the first day you start the job, people ask if you want to run the, com uh, want, want to run the company. And I just think but that's what most people want to do, though, right? That's what most MPs go It for. is, but, but Sophie, the, th the thing is, people spend so much time focusing on personalities. We never focus on the serious issues. And I think it's a distraction. We should focus on what we're doing now. Uh, the five priorities the Prime Minister has talked about, including economic growth, which is what I'm delivering, and I'm really excited that we've brought home the biggest trade deal since we left the European Union, and that's what I want to talk about. That's um, what matters. You, you want to talk about that, that's what matters, but at the same time, after, you know, over a decade of Conservative rule, debt over 100% GDP, growth is 0.2%, inflation over 8%, mm -hmm. Keir Starmer out and about today saying he's the one who can be trusted on the economy. Are you a bit worried that voters might believe that? Um, no, no, I'm not worried, uh, because he might be saying that, but he doesn't have any ideas, he doesn't have any plans. The fact is, uh, you know, all over the world, there are serious issues with inflation. The pandemic has had an effect. The uh, war in Russia and Ukraine has had an effect all over. Even here in New Zealand, I'm talking to ministers here, and they're talking about inflation. They're talking about the cost of living crisis. We're all dis di discussing what we're going to do about it. All Keir Starmer has done is made up a new word uh, to describe things. He doesn't have any answers, so I'm not worried at all. You had, um, just finally, um, you had a very different upbringing to most MPs. Uh, you went to school in Nigeria, where you carried a machete. How did that prepare you for the knives at Westminster? <laughs> I'm not sure anything can prepare you for life um, in Westminster. You know, I used a machete because that's how we cut grass there. There are no lawnmowers um, in Nigeria when I was growing up. So um, it, you got very blistered uh, using, using them. But, um, I think that actually growing up in a third world country just makes you appreciate what an amazing country the UK is. And I'm really proud to be representing it on, on the world stage. It's been one of my proudest moments today, so that's been quite fantastic. Okay, Kemi Adnot, thank you very much indeed for being on the programme today.